Hey everybody, thanks for coming. Um, happy to see everybody here today. Uh, just how this is going to go, I'm going to get up here and talk for a while. And uh, I've got five talks planned. We can, if we get them done quickly, maybe we can throw in a sixth one. Or uh, if we go longer, we have more questions. That's fine too, no problem. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand while I'm talking. And as soon as I get to the end of a sentence or a paragraph, whatever's necessary, I'll answer your question, no problem. Uh, so don't, if you have any question, like my purpose for being here <clears throat> is education. So I don't want you to go away uh, thinking like you were confused about anything. So if you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to stop me. I'll drink tea from time to time just to keep my throat okay. A couple of you were at the, uh, the symposium I did in Virginia last year and I was super sick and uh, I drank like a gallon of tea during the day. That, which brings me to my next point. Between each talk we're going to do breaks so you can go to the bathroom or whatever, reset your brain so we can start over again so you're just not sitting here for six hours straight and getting overloaded. So I think uh, regular breaks is really good for your brain and for retention and everything. I'm Solomon Parker. A little bit about myself. I started beekeeping back in the very early days of treatment-free beekeeping. Um, I decided, I, I graduated from high school in 2002, 2002 and um, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life as many 18-year-olds uh, are, are at that time. So uh, we had a commercial beekeeper that set up his, one of his um, layover yards between almonds and apples, pollination, in the spring there. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll try to be a beekeeper. So I uh, started doing some research online, spent a lot of time on BeeSource and, and other sites. Um, that was in the very early days of beekeeping. If any of you are familiar with Michael Bush, who's another notable treatment-free beekeeper, he had just had his first winter where all of his hives didn't die. So that was good um, back in the early days. Uh, at that time, Dee Lesby was um, much more active online and she was a treatment-free beekeeper. She was kind of the, the grandmother of treatment-free beekeeping. She was in, uh, she developed small cell beekeeping in Arizona in the mid to late 80s to combat tracheal mites. Um, so she was, she was an available model that I could, uh, you know, somebody who was successful that I could start and, and emulate so, until I could get going. And I'll talk a little bit about that later about how to get started and, and uh, how, to, how to choose things and how to, how to do what you need to do. So uh, in 2005, I moved to Arkansas and uh, brought my bees with me there a couple of years later. Um, and that's when I experienced some of what I'll talk about with uh, beekeeping being local because one of the things I talk about a lot is buying bees and how bringing in bees from other places can be hard to your beekeeping experience. Uh, so I learned that bees don't really like to be moved. They like to be local and acclimated to their area. They weren't meant to migrate. Um, from there, I uh, I'd totally been off the internet for about eight years. Went back, started getting back on the internet in 2011. Started, because that's when I was really getting back into not just keeping bees, but really advancing my beekeeping knowledge and becoming someone who grafted queens and made nucleus hives and sold honey and did, did all that sort of fun stuff. So I really encourage people to jump in, get in there, try new things. I personally like to, to pick one or two things every year, try something new, learn something new, um, especially something that you're afraid of. A lot of people are the, the, the leap to go into grafting queens. They're, that's a big leap for a lot of people. And I'm, you know, just pick a year, you know, pick this year. And if you don't even want to graft queens, get, get a grafting tool and just try it and see, see what it's like. And maybe it won't be so scary. And one of my favorite videos on YouTube, I haven't, I haven't figured out how to insert it into my uh, slideshow, but it's a 12 year old girl down in Argentina is the fastest grafting grafter I've ever seen. And if a 12 year old girl can do it, certainly, certainly you all can do it. Um, so in the, uh, the 20 teens, I, in Arkansas, I got into queen rearing. 
So I, my, my typical year would, would be, I would go into winter with 25 hives or so, with the goal of coming out of winter with 20 or more. Usually ended up, you know, being 22 or 23. My losses were typically, I say, 5 to 20%. Um, so I always like to encourage people to go into winter with enough so that you have what you're looking for when you come out from winter. Because it's really easy, you know, if you want to have five, it's really easy to come out of winter with eight or something, six, and get back to five. It's really difficult to come out from winter with two or three and get back to five. Well, that's not really difficult, but it's harder. It's much easier to lose hives than it, hives than it is to gain hives. Um, so I started raising nukes, raising queens, kind of developed my own methods for queen rearing. Not that they're mine, they weren't my idea, just, you know, my... Um, ways that I figured that were, were really efficient, ways that really work better for a backyard beekeeper rather than the methods that uh, big commercial beekeepers use when they raise hundreds of queens at a time. I doubt there's more than one or two people in this room who'd be interested in making a hundred queens at a time. You might be interested in making five or ten. There's probably a lot more of you that'd be interested in that. So that's the, the sort of methods that I use methods that are geared toward that sort of level, right? I tell people that you're not commercial beekeepers, so there's no reason to keep bees like commercial beekeeper. You're backyard beekeepers, you're hobbyists, so keep bees like hobbyists. And that's part of what I talk about a lot is, is how to do that, keeping that mindset rather than um, a mindset where your entire livelihood, your paycheck and your family's health and well-being is based on how well you do with your bees. Um, so, I was, during the, the late 2000s and 20 teens, I was in school for civil engineering. And uh, when I graduated from that, I went, got a job, kept doing the beekeeping thing, got laid off from my job in Arkansas, moved to Denver, moved my bees to Denver also. Um, Denver's a very harsh climate for, uh, for bees, in, from Arkansas anyway. So I went from warm, humid weather bees with generally dry winters to um, Denver where the summer is where you get most of your rain, but it's dry. In the winter, you get snow and it's still dry and it's really cold and lots of wind all the time. So it's a very significant difference in climate. I uh, ended up hating my job in Denver, ended up hating the big city. It's just so many people. I'm a country boy. I was raised out in the country in southern Oregon. I, uh, it seemed like whatever you wanted to do in Denver, there was 5,000 other people out there doing it. If you wanted to go fishing, there was one person every 25 feet the entire length of the river. Um, if you wanted to go ride a motorcycle, I, I have a motorcycle I like to ride up in the mountains and stuff. There's 5,000 other motorcycles up there. Um, what really did it for us is we went uh, miniature golfing and we had to wait 45 minutes and everybody thought that was normal and I didn't, so we moved. <laughs> so we got back to Oregon, brought my bees back to Oregon. I keep them now next door to my father's place on my, my grandparents' old property. My grandparents died about 15 years ago and um, uh, the property was sold by my, my relatives, and so the, the guy who lives there now is a beekeeper. He doesn't live there. He owns the property. Nobody lives there right now. Uh, and so I asked him, and he said I could keep my bees there. So it's, it's a great, great spot. Um, have a couple other yards in the area. And so now I am f sort of finishing up the reacclimation time for, for moving the bees to Oregon. I'm noticing now the first year when I moved, um, the bees survived well enough, but they just didn't, they weren't thriving. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do, like I thought. Um, the second year, a couple hives started being that really thriving, what I'm looking for. Now this is the th third winter and I'm seeing, you know, more like half to three quarters of the hives are really looking healthy throughout the winter. And so that's what I'm going for, getting back into um, raising nukes and queens. So, uh, let's start with the first talk. Um, yeah. Is there a way you could turn up your mic a little bit? Yes. Uh, can we turn up the mic? I don't have it. Yeah. 
What's that? <laughs> the, the mic. Can we turn up the mic? Oh, he, I guess he did. <laughs> Hello. No, lights are fine, but I guess I'm I'm a little soft spoken. Without a microphone, I'd be worn out in an hour. I've thought of taking up smoking, but I'm not sure it's what I'm looking for. That's better. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Great. All right, so the, the fun thing about this talk is that the title is really catchy. And sometimes when I tell people the name of the talk, uh, they, they promote it because they think it's really catchy. And sometimes they don't promote it because they don't. Or sometimes I just don't tell them and I tell them what the talk's about. So the talk's about my basic case for why I keep bees treatment free. So I'm going to share that with you now. So there was a guy on a helicopter tour of Seattle. And as they're flying around touring Seattle, it gets foggy all of a sudden, and the helicopters can't find out where he's going. His instruments aren't working right. And so they're, they're going really slow, and they, they spot a building in the fog. Get up close to the building, and uh, so the pilot holds up a sign and says, where am I? And uh, the guy in the building holds up a sign and says, you're in a helicopter. <laughs> and the pilot goes, oh, OK, and turns around and flies back down, to, down south to, to uh, SeaTac and lands. And the passenger is like totally confused the whole way back to the airport. He says, what is going on? So when they finally land, he asks him, like, how did you know where to go? And he said, well, when he held up the sign that said, you're in a helicopter, it was true, but it was completely useless. So I knew we were at Microsoft Technical Support. <laughs> <laughs> so from there, I knew how to get back to the, to the airport. <laughs> the reason I tell that story is I want, to, I want to expose you to the idea that we know why the bees are dying. Their mites is the problem. But that doesn't really answer the question. That doesn't really solve the problem. Just because we know that mites are doing it, watch out for that. Um, that doesn't really solve things for us. That, le that leads us into a mindset where we want to throw treatments or, in another way of looking at it, throw money at the problem, which is a typical American solution to things. So first of all, let's talk about some definitions. Um, what is treatment free? The way that I look at treatment free is that I don't want to do anything to the bees that is causing them to survive, help them survive when normally they shouldn't be. If I were to break a break my foot like I did, uh, I, was, I went out and checked on my bees one time in Denver and I wrecked, I hit a, I hit a mud puddle, bike flipped over, landed on my foot, broke my foot couldn't keep bees for a while. If I was in a, even a, an organic or a, or a chemical-free beekeeping regimen where I'm doing bird breaks and things and, and you know, heavy maintenance, um, if, I'm, if I'm laid up with a broken foot and I can't do that, my bees are going to suffer because they can't survive without me. So even though that's not a chemical, it's not a drug, it's still a treatment. So what I'm looking for is bees that don't need my help at all. That's my goal. Okay. If if um, uh, like D. Lesby down in, in Arizona, if she forgets where one of her yards is because she's got <laughs> dozens of yards and they're way out in the desert where nobody can find them, if she gets forgets where one of them is for a couple years, which is not out of the realm of possibility, <laughs> she goes back to that yard, and for the most part, the bees are still there. You know, if, uh, if you take a, a normal treated apiary, well, especially with the commercial beekeepers, and they forget where one of their layover yards is one year, moving from um, almonds to a apples or something, most of those bees are going to die of massive mite crashes pretty quickly. 
Um, so I don't use hard chemicals, soft chemicals, powdered sugar. Um, I don't feed as much as I can. I would consider feeding to be treatment against starvation. Now that's not a hard and fast rule. Well, it's nuanced because I don't want to, especially with new beekeepers, I don't want to make them think that they just can stop doing everything and everything will be fine because that's not the case. When you're starting with a package especially, that first year they're in a very odd situation and they might need help. And it's okay to do that at the beginning, but the ultimate goal is to get away from that. The ultimate goal is bees that can take care of themselves. Okay? Uh, so, I use the bond method, which comes from the, uh, the movie Live and Let Die. And that was kind of named that way by a guy named Dr. John Kefis, who in his um, middle-aged days of beekeeping helped to develop some of the, the mite treatments like Kumafos in, uh, in France in the 80s, before mites were even introduced in the United States. And when he got into the, the, the mid to late 90s, he decided he wanted to not be dependent on treatments as well because Kumafos is a really nasty chemical. And still to this day, because it's used for other things, not just bees, to this day, people die of it every year. Like the average is like 20 people die of Kumafos poisoning every year. It's a really nasty chemical. So he came up with this idea where he was just gonna let the bees go and let them die. And he did, and pretty quickly, you, you would lose a certain percentage of them, 70, 80, 90% in the worst cases. And from those, he would breed back. And, and then he got to the point where his bees were doing really well, and there weren't mites in his, in his bees anymore. And he actually, if you go online and, and check out the older stories, he would actually pay, I think it was one euro cent, if you could find mites in his hives. And I think the, the most he ever had to pay out was like 12 cents, something like that. But he got to the point where nobody could find mites in his hives anymore. And he was concerned that the bees weren't being maintained under that selection pressure, so they were going to lose their mite resistance. I don't think that's probably a problem because mites are ubiquitous, they're everywhere. So he started bringing in infected hives with bad mites and putting those frames of bees into his hives just to maintain his selection pressure. And so he's been treatment free in France there for, should be about 20 years now. Uh, I did a, did a podcast with him, you can check that out. I'll give you the address later. So the, the way that we know that this works, what's my next slide? Natural selection. I like to use the, um, the cheetah and the gazelle because we've all seen that on Discovery Channel. Um, natural selection, we probably all learned in school, is survival of the fittest. But really it's not survival of the fittest, it's survival of the adequate. The fittest are the, the ones who are the best able to reproduce in their environment. Um, but survival of the adequate, most of the gazelle out on the Serengeti are just adequate. It's not the adequate gazelle that get eaten, it's the slow gazelle that get eaten, right? So we're using, we're letting the mites pick off the worst of the worst bees in that case, in that, in that example. Now we're not trying to cause evolution. Uh, what we're really doing is trying to cause adaptation. And there's a few different ways we can look at adaptation. The way that I like to look at it is there's no golden bullet or silver bullet or whatever bullet is appropriate for this situation. We're not fighting vampires or anything, so. But there's no treatment-free bee that you can buy that will just be treatment-free. And that's one of the misunderstandings that a lot of people ask me is if you have treatment free bees and you've been doing this for so long and, and successfully why aren't people knocking down your door to get your bees well i do get plenty of customers i've never had a problem selling queens but um the problem is that all beekeeping is local and so if i sell you queens out here it's going to take a year two or three for your bees to be for your, when I sell you bees, for those bees to get acclimated to this area. And so there's not really any point in importing something 
just so that you have to do the same process that I did there. I think it's much more easy for you to do it here with your own bees that are already acclimated and already have a leg up on life. So what we're doing, yes? So what you're saying is it's not a genetic trait, it's, it's a regional trait and all bees have that. It's not a specific genetic trait. It is, it is involved in genetics, but the way I like to look at it is it is a, it's a combination of traits. Right, so we look at traits like um, one of the new ones that's been popular lately is mite maulers. Some of the older ones, uh, SMR, suppressed mite reproduction. Um, VSH, varroa sensitive hygiene. Um, the Minnesota hygienic bees. All these are a collection of traits. And if we, like the Minnesota hygienic, they've really developed their hygienic bees really well. But they have to, in their breeding program, they have to increase the amount of hygienic behavior in their bees so much that their breeder queens are so hygienic that the workers will chew out healthy brood. So that when they, then when they mate out with drones wherever, it brings that back down to a level which is more useful. Now that's really good for traits like um, uh, American fowl brood. Their, their bees have been tested to be totally resistant to American fowl brood. And even they did, uh, Marla Spivak did one study where she showed that her bees would actually remove and clean up cases of American fowl brood. So that was really awesome to find out. However, that hygienic trait, while it is helpful with Varroa, it's not the whole solution. And it's been shown with her bees that they're not treatment free on the, on the Varroa front because they still, it's, it's a single trait that hasn't solved the whole problem. Um, so what I focus on is, and I don't do mite tests because, you know, with, with hers, with the hygienic, they do a, what they do is they take like a, a coffee can and they imprint it on the comb or stick it, you know, push it into the comb. They pour um, uh, liquid nitrogen on it and freeze the brood and then put that back in the hive. And then when the bees chew that out to get, to get the dead brood, however they are able to sense the dead brood, um, and then that's how you can gauge how hygienic the hive is. My only issue with that is my bees don't typically encounter liquid nitrogen, so I'm not sure how helpful that is. <laughs> um, so what I do is I let them figure it out because there are almost assuredly traits that we haven't even discovered yet that are helping <coughs> bees survive without treatment. Uh, one of the ones that I saw just recently Somebody found a bee um, on a fuzzy, the stem of a fuzzy plant, and this bee was trying its darndest to get this mite, rub the mite off on the, on the plant. Now that's not something you're ever going to discover in a hive because it doesn't happen in a hive. That's a trait that bees can either learn or develop genetically that we would never discover if we weren't watching bees out landing on a fuzzy plant. So there are almost certainly traits that we don't know about. And if we don't know about them, we can't purposely breed for them. <clears throat> so when I first started beekeeping, I was told that mite resistant bees could never be developed because there's no such thing as a wolf resistant sheep. It just can't be done because it's just not possible. Only later did I realize that there are wolf resistant sheep. These are sheep, these are obviously bighorn sheep, um, but there are other, you know, mountain goats and basically all wild sheep and, and goats are wolf resistant. Why are they wolf resistant? Because they've spent the entire history of their species getting away from wolves. That's what they do. That's what they have to do to survive and breed and reproduce. Um, the problem is we as humans have, you know, we found these sheep and we decided, hey, I want some wool, I want some, some meat, I want some, some hide. And we don't really need the horns because if they hit you in the shins, those really hurt. Anybody raise sheep? You probably know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, so over the years, we've, we've bred for um, big, fatty, woolly sheep with short legs um, and less horns. <clears throat> Excuse me. And over time, we have developed 
human-friendly sheep, and they were no longer wolf-resistant sheep. Now the problem when we try to domesticate bees is bees are, for lack of a better term, wild animals. Right? We can't keep them in a pen. They have to be able to go out and do their thing. The queen has to go out and mate on her own. The best we can do is breed for things like gentleness and honey production, but we can't truly domesticate them because they're not fully under our control. And it seems to me that when we do try to domesticate them, they resist by dying. <laughs> so that's what the problem that we get with, um, with uh, treated bees, because by by treating them, by taking care of the mite problem for them, by shooting the wolves for them, we are eliminating their ability to develop traits or concentrate a number of traits to get the job done. If they don't have that selection pressure, they're not going to maintain that ability. Now selection is always happening. Even in treated bees, selection always happens. Uh, even with the very first treatments in the early days when treatments were really effective, you still lost the worst of the worst bees. And that's because of two things. Number one, you lose the worst of the worst bees because the bees themselves weren't developed to resist mites. You, you all probably know the history of varroa mites that came from uh, Southeast Asia on a different species of honeybee. And that species of honeybee, the mites and the bees coexisted for so long, that the mites are basically just a, a secondary pest. They're just something that doesn't ever really kill hives unless the hive is already really bad off for some other reason. So here we lost the worst of the worst first and there's also the second aspect of that which is really super virulent mites. And so what happens is you get really super virulent mites that, that either breed really quickly or, or breed uh, in greater numbers and they will kill a hive, but at the same time, they're usually also killing themselves. So that's not good for their species either. So that's where we look at back with the, uh, the uh, gazelle and the cheetah. Um, if all the gazelle are slow and they get eaten by the cheetahs, the cheetah population balloons for a while, and then they run out of gazelles, and they starve to death and everybody dies. But if the, the gazelle are really fast and the cheetah doesn't catch up, the cheetah doesn't keep um, developing the ability to run faster and faster, then all the cheetahs die and they go out of, they go out of business. So it's, it's, a, it's a process that continues forever. Like I said, there's no silver bullet for treatment-free beekeeping. This, it's, it's because it's a process that continues on forever. You, the, pe the pest can't get too virulent, too nasty, too good at its job, or it kills itself. And the prey uh, has to keep running, keep developing traits to outrun the predator, or they all die. Now we know that that, one second, we know that that doesn't happen because we've had plenty of feral bees that have survived without treatment since the beginning. One good example is my, um, my great uncle, Wayne. I should get a picture of him. He was a funny looking guy. <laughs> Um, he used to keep about 50 hives and he kept them from I think the 1940s all the way up till till he died in what was it 2008 or something um, and he went through the the mite era and he refused to believe that he had mites because he never saw any now we all know that again mites are ubiquitous they're everywhere you can't get away from them if you don't think you have them it's just because you haven't seen them and that's fine I'm not worried about that but he went from 50 hives down to five but those five continued to survive throughout the mite era and um, where he lived there are still feral bees there that I've, I've, I've seen personally so I know they're still there so if you hear someone tell you that uh, without treatment um, the bees never would have survived, that's not true. And many people know for a fact that that's not true, but not everybody has seen it for themselves. Yeah. Um, that process of ebb and flow that you were talking about, mm -hmm. I, I like to use the term dynamic equilibrium. For that. That's a good term. Dynamic equilibrium. That means it's staying, it's staying relatively level, but it's not staying still, right? It's, it's, move, it's always moving. That's an important thing to remember. It's always moving. As time goes on, we hope 
that the bees will continue to develop traits to deal with mites, and we hope that the mites will continue to kill themselves off if they get too virulent. Now, one of the good cases that, that has shown this is uh, Tom Seeley has published his work in the Arnott Forest, where uh, the bees survived the mites for, I forget how many years, at least 30 or 40 years. And from their from, from his experiments there, he discovered that if you introduce mites from other places into those hives, the bees can't deal with them very well. The traits that were developed in that area are specifically because the mites reduced their own population because they were too bad for the bees. They killed off all the hives, the, the, leaving only the less virulent mites. And since that's kind of a, an isolated population, that's how that population developed. Now here in the US where we have uh, 2.6 million kept hives or whatever it is, and huge numbers of hives that move across the country and around the country all year long for pollination and honey production, we can't really do that. There aren't really any isolated populations and as soon as you get an isolated population and you try and export that to another area, the same thing happens with the bees from the Arnott Forest and they haven't really developed the traits needed to deal with the mites and so they get killed off. But in our case, we have to focus more on the bees that develop traits to get rid of the mites rather than mites that kill themselves off to keep from getting too bad. So some good examples. Anybody ever heard of the bee wolf? Bruce has. This is just the, uh, the wax moth. Wax moths weren't originally part of our beekeeping world here in the US. They were introduced sometime in the, the 1700s, 1800s, not exactly, the very early 1800s, maybe late 1700s. And they were so bad that they were actually killing healthy hives. And there was a, a huge What's the opposite of a boom? There was a crash of the beekeeping community in the early 1800s. Uh, it used to be very common for virtually every farmer to keep, you know, 10 or 15 hives. And uh, there was the, the bee wolf was introduced and a lot of the hives crashed and a lot of farmers quit keeping bees. But there wasn't a treatment for wax moths and there still isn't. You can't actively treat them. Um, but over the years, the bees developed bees that Okay, I need, to, I need to clarify something here. Bees don't develop resistance. What happens is the bees that have no resistance die. The bees that do have resistance continue to breed and multiply and fill the environment. So the bees don't develop traits. Traits are revealed. It's the same, uh, who is it, Michelangelo said that when he, when he carves a sculpture, he removes all of the marble that isn't the sculpture. That's kind of what we're doing with natural selection. When a pest is introduced into a population, in this case mites into bees, the mites remove all the bees that aren't resistant to mites. The bees that are still there don't develop resistance. Resistance is revealed. And then once those bees are able to reproduce, then it's sort of a process of developing because now you're expanding again. Everybody got that? Have I been unclear? Okay, so um, the bees got over the mites, or the, the wax moths in this case. Another example is CCD. Now I, I know it's kind of hard to see, kind of a hard diagram because of the small writing, but this is CCD and there are a number of things listed around in these circles. I can't even read them for here, from here, but there are aspects that they think are causing part of the CCD problem, colony collapse disorder. No one's ever demonstrated or shown how it could be treated for or dealt with. But a lot of bees have died that couldn't deal with it and the ones that can deal with it are doing better now. Because there wasn't a treatment for it. And it also works for beekeepers because um, when you lose all your bees and go bankrupt and then buy new bees and go bankrupt, you can only do that two or three times before you, you give up. So 
it eliminated some uh, some natural selection in beekeepers. <laughs> Another good example is American fowl brood, which has been, as far as I'm aware, it's been in this country as long as bees have. It has been a worse problem in the past, but because we tend to kill every hive that gets it, it tends to be self-selecting to be a very minor problem. Only one to two percent of all hives come down with a case of American fowl brood in a given year. That's a very low incidence for disease. Why is that? Because there was no treatment. It, it was introduced before treatment was available. And still, technically, there is no treatment for American fowl brood. And the reason why that is is because American fowl brood is a bacteria. It is a spore-forming bacteria. And what that is is when a, a spore-forming bacteria enc encounters conditions in which it can't live, it will dehydrate itself and shrink down and become basically a seed. And then when conditions are available again for it to grow, it absorbs water and becomes a bacteria. It starts dividing and does what bacteria do. There is no way to treat for a spore-forming bacteria. They can't be killed. Um, if you do treat for American fowl brood, the problem is you're going to kill a lot of the microbiology that's going on in a hive. And a lot of that microbiology competes with American fowl brood for resources. And so if you kill all of that, and then, but you leave all the seeds, they're going to grow again the next time when they get good opportunities. And now none of that other stuff that competes with American fowl brood will be there, and the American fowl brood will come back. So once you treat for American fowl brood, you have it forever. And you have to keep treating, or the hive will crash. Now, like I said, there's, there's no treatment for it. It just doesn't ultimately work. It masks the sim symptoms for a while, but it can't be cured. When American fowl brood was introduced to North Africa from France through queens, some queens were taken from France to North Africa, it devastated the local beekeeping um, world. I've seen, I've seen pictures of hives that they basically just took apart, there's, there's combs laying all over the place. They all look like this, they're disgusting. And it has a very nasty smell also. If, has anybody ever encountered American fowl brood? That's good, usually, usually it's not a big problem. And like I said, with, um, with American treatment-free bees, which are usually have some level of hygienic behavior, American fowl brood is not usually a problem. I've only, there's, I've, I've heard of very few um, um, uh, treatment-free beekeepers that have had, even ha had cases of American fowl brood show up. Tracheal mites. Does anybody treat for tracheal mites? Or has anybody ever treated for tracheal mites? What happened? Basically, Varroa came along, and that was such a big, huge problem that everybody forgot tracheal mites existed. And so tracheal mites don't exist anymore. That's what happened. When I, was, when I first started beekeeping, like people treated for tracheal mites. Tracheal mites were a huge problem in the, uh, in the 80s. And that's what uh, D. Lesby came up with small cell as a solution for. But once, uh, once the varroa mites came along and, and became a huge problem, people didn't have time for tracheal mites. And tracheal mites aren't really a problem anymore. Maybe they still exist. Maybe they don't. Maybe they've reduced themselves to a, a less virulent parasite. but. Nobody treats for them anymore. Chalk brood. Chalk brood is another disease that you can't treat for because it is fungal. And if you try to put an antifungal in a hive, you also remove the fungus that, that uh, processes um, pollen. When bees bring pollen into the hive, they kind of ferment it or Technically, the term is fermentation because it is a, is a fungus. But um, that helps to break down some of the proteins so that when they feed that pollen to the brood, that uh, they can digest it. So if that, that uh, fungus isn't there to do the pre-digestion, basically the, the brood will starve to death and you'll have a, a hive that doesn't work very well. So what happens to chalk brood? Chalk brood tends to be now a very minor 
disease. It's, it's a stress disease. When your bees are stressed, a lot of times in uh, late winter, early spring, when there's a cold snap or something, you'll get a few hives that get chalk brood. Usually they can clean it up. You'll see this on the front of your hive. And this is, these are mummified brood that the bees are taking out. And usually when conditions get better and they stop being stressed anymore, it goes away on its own. And Varroa. In my case, with my bees and uh, my great uncle's bees, there was a, a big initial loss, right? We we're chipping away at the marble until we revealed the David, and we come out with, on the other side, treatment free bees. And in this case, it's, we're mostly just talking about Varroa, but we, we do this for all the diseases. So I've. It, one of the things I like to point out is that throughout all the years, uh, the last 25, 30 years of um, professional bee breeding, line breeding, artificial insemination, etc., nobody has developed a treatment free marketable bee other than Bee Weaver in Texas. And the way they did it was by stopping treating and dealing with the consequences. The only way to ultimately deal with the problem of varroa and other parasites and diseases is to let the bees do it. They can do it. We know they can do it. We've seen they can do it. We just need to let them do it. And that involves a big change in mindset and how we do things. And so that's what today what I'm here to talk to you about is that entire change in mindset. You'll notice this is a gazelle. <laughs> When we treat, we take that gazelle and we put them in a trailer and we drag them across the, the Serengeti at 75 miles an hour so that the cheetah can't ch catch up. Problem is, pretty quickly we, we, we run out of gas or we blow a tire or something and now that gazelle is fat and lazy and will be picked off by even the fattest, laziest cheetah. And that's, I, I, I don't want to be vulgar with those terms. But what, what's happening is that we are removing, by treating, we're removing the ability of the bees to deal with the problem themselves. We're removing that selection pressure. Right? We, we've stopped chipping away at the marble to find the statue inside. And the problem with that, even more, is that we, we've created weak bees in this case, but we've also created strong mites. Because by killing the mites, we are killing all the weak ones. We never kill all of them. Even, if, even the most effective treatment doesn't get two-thirds of the mites, which are typically inside the cells in the hive. And even if we did develop a treatment that killed all the mites in the hive, it wouldn't get all of them. There's always going to be somebody who is resistant. There's always going to be somebody who's going to figure out how to, how to bypass the problem and continue to survive and reproduce. Um, not only that, but there's no way to treat all of the bees in the world. There's a huge proportion of the bees in this country are feral and nobody can get to them to treat them if they had to, if they needed to. I had my longest living hive from the very beginning. When I started back in 2003, I bought 20 packages because I'm an overachiever. And packages were much cheaper back then. What's your, what's your package price? 100 bucks. 100 bucks here? 100 bucks? You guys got pretty reasonable prices. 140? Yeah, that's still pretty reasonable. There's a lot of areas. I imagine that's because you have a bigger population density, and so you can get more delivered up here in bulk, so they're a little cheaper. Other places I've seen as high as 200, so it's pretty rough. Um, Back when I bought them, they were $35, so that was nice. So I started out with 20, and um, one of those hives that I, from the very beginning survived 10 and a half years without treatment before it naturally expired. Um, and technically, because I split off of that hive, in a sense, I've still got hives that are still alive from that original 
that have their direct lineages, lineage back to there. But technically, they weren't the same hive. I'm talking about one single hive that's naturally, queens naturally replaced from time to time. Um, anyway, I f forget which year, so that would have been 10 years, so that would have been 2013. Going into the winter, I looked in that hive in my, my final fall inspection, and the hive was, I pulled out a frame and there's mites. Like I can see many mites on bees. I can see mites crawling on the comb. I'm looking in the comb and I can see mites on the brood. There's just loaded with mites. It's, if you did a mite test, they would tell you, don't even worry about treating because it's gonna die. Might as well just kill it. So I, I just put it back together. I didn't bother trying to feed it or save it or do anything with it. It was gone, wasn't worried about it. Uh, a couple months later, when I started opening the hives again for the first time in the, the late winter spring, um, well, I had one dead hive, and it wasn't that one. That hive survived, and I, and I opened it up, and there's no mites. And I, there's no mites. Like, what happened? I was as surprised as anybody else, because I thought it was going to die. I wasn't worried about even worrying about it. Like, it's just going to die. Just let it go. Um, so, unless... And I'll, and I'll talk about a little bit later about the, you've all probably heard the term mite bomb. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but unless we actually let the bees figure things out on their own, we don't know what they can actually deal with. And if, from my experience, it is good to, to combine weak hives or hives that might be dealing with, with bad mite problems in the fall to, to keep mites from spreading to your neighbors if you're concerned about your neighbors. Maybe you don't like your neighbors, that's fine too. Um, but if we don't actually let them do their business, we don't actually know what they can survive. And that's why I try not to just requeen a hive that's not doing well. Even the only time I requeen a hive is if it's really mean because that doesn't solve itself over time. If a hive is weak, they'll either continue to be weak or they'll maybe uh, requeen themselves and get over it. And so if I'm gonna, if I wanna requeen something, I will take a split off of that and put the new queen in the split and then let the old hive figure itself out. And if it does, great. Then I've, I've maintained some genetic diversity I might not have had before if I had killed it off. And if it doesn't, then I don't worry about it because that's something I really don't need anymore. Yeah. In the hive that lasted 10 years, did, did you recycle any of the uh, brood comb? You mean year, out, year by year? Yeah, uh, over time. Yeah, I generally will try and add one or two new frames of foundation into the the brood comb the brood area in each box so that within five or hopefully sooner than ten years the very oldest comb will be cycled out and recycled. I do that, yes. And the reason why I do that is to kind of um, in nature we need to remember how a natural ca hive cavity works. Uh, dying is actually part of the natural process if, if you can't get a hold of that idea. Um, uh, uh, just given an empty cavity, and a hive will move in there, a swarm will, will move in there, build comb, they'll keep in there alive for five to ten years, usually. At some point something will happen that will cause them to die out. They'll go queenless, maybe a, a super seizure queen doesn't come back from her mating flight, maybe something happens to the queen. For whatever reason the hive dies, and it's left empty comb. Wax moths come in, eat up all the comb. It might rot out again for empty for a couple years. Or maybe, maybe the first empty year, a new swarm will move in. And by that, the, uh, the comb, which is a wax or a, an oil-based, you know, a lipid, a fat-based chemical, absorbs chemicals from the environment and keeps them away from the bees. It kind of serves as the bee's liver to help process um, nasty stuff out of the hive. And when the wax moths come along and eat that, it goes away. It becomes wax moth poop, which then the new bees can carry out and dump outside when they're cleaning out their cavity. Um, so by, by doing that comb replacement myself, I'm speeding that process up a little bit. I'm continually removing whatever's nasty from the hive. 
and I don't have to let the hive die of whatever reason. I can I can keep it for my purposes rather than uh, let it go completely natural. So because I want to, my my important focus is to keep people from. Um, I want to be practical. I don't just want to get up here and, and tell you uh, lofty philosophical concepts and leave you to flounder and figure it out. I want to tell you exactly what to do and what not to do. The number one thing to not do is just stop treating. If you just stop treating treated bees, they're, without treatment, they're probably going to die. Right now. Eventually, we're going to leave it up to them to survive on their own, but there's some things that we can do. We need to change our mindset um, to keep ourselves. The bees don't care. There's plenty of bees. Don't worry about that. Um, they don't really care. It's, it's our purposes, and I want to see beekeepers succeed. Because there's a lot of new, new beekeepers that get into things, and they pay a bunch of money for a hive setup and a, and a, and a starter kit and a package of bees, and it dies and it, they do it again, and it dies, and they do it again, and eventually they're going to get tired of it and quit. That's the thing that I really don't want to do. I want to teach bees to keep, te teach people. <laughs> Freudian slip. Uh, I want to teach people how to change their mindset and be able to do this in a way that, number one, they're not spending a lot of money. Because when you spend money on something, there's this, this thing that you get, when you buy something, you want your money to, to not be wasted. You want to protect your investment. This is, this is totally natural, just human nature. But when we apply that mindset to beekeeping, we get in this vicious cycle where we do the same things over and over, expecting different results. And it's just not going to happen. So that leads me to my second point. Don't just replace your dead bees with more bees that are, you know, I'm, that are going to die, honestly. Because packages, I, I should put a, I have a, a nice little graph that shows um, the rates of package loss. It's at least 50%. It's hard to know what exactly it is because the, the Bee Informed National Survey that I get most of my information for statistics from doesn't ask you, you know, each hive, was it a package, did it die? They, they, and they don't, they don't ask exactly how many years of experience you have either. They only ask if you have less than five. So if you take the less than five years of experience people and you take the people who got their packages or got packages, they started beekeeping through packages, and you check their loss rates. You combine that information, you get 53% loss rate in the last season. So that means somewhere around 50, maybe even more percent of packages don't survive their first year. Does anybody ever buy a car expecting it to blow up within a year? You could, but you're not going to pay very much money for it, right? I bought a, I bought a, it was a 1981 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme, and it blew up on me, but I paid like $100. So it's pretty good for a full, full size car for only 100 bucks. It was, it got, I got my 100 bucks out of it, honestly. Um, another thing that you should not, don't do is catch swarms. You should catch swarms. And I don't mean that you should put your number on a, on a, on a list to be called when, when a swarm appears somewhere. Uh, that's fine if you want to do that. If you've got the kind of job that allows you to take time off and, and go catch swarms, that's great. That's a lot of fun. Uh, I really enjoy doing that. But um, I can't always do that. My, my, I'm busy. You know, a lot of you are busy. A lot of you have jobs that don't allow you to do that. So uh, one, of the, one of the talks I'll be talking about later is how to make swarm traps. Because a swarm trap, you can catch a swarm without being there. And you basically set up a swarm trap, put it up in, in a good spot. It'll catch a swarm, probably. You come back and get it later. And the only thing you've invested in is that piece of equipment, which is reusable. So for the price that you can pay for a package of bees, you can make three swarm traps and probably get at least one swarm out of that. 
that to me is a much better investment. Because if those bees die, you still have the swarm trap and you can still go catch more swarms for free. And when you get into the mindset of being able to catch more bees for free, you're not quite so worried about protecting your investment because your investment is in the equipment and you can buy a treatment for that, it's called paint, and that works really well. But the bees, not so much. <laughs> Next thing is only keeping one or two hives. Um, there was a guy I met last weekend in Alaska. I did a beekeeping symposium there. His name's Larry and I forgot, his, was it O'Connor? Whatever his last name was. He's a, he's a great, uh, great beekeeping guy. Really, he's written a bunch of books, published, republished a bunch of old books. You can find them around. Um, but he said that a single hive beekeeper is likely to have a 60% loss rate year on year. You have a 60% chance of losing all of your one hives every year. The more hives you have, if you have two, your chances of losing uh, all your hives in one year drops to like 30 or 40 percent. If you have three, it drops to like 10 or 20 percent. And you get, you know, where I keep, I like to keep 20 or 30, your chances of losing all your hives in a year drop to minuscule. And that's what I like to keep people away from is losing all their hives in one year because it's really hard to build back from zero. Um, so I recommend five. That may be too much. Maybe you have a, a, a homeowner's co-op or something like that that doesn't allow you to have that many. Um, my, my beekeeping ordinance in, in my city I think is two hives on per property or may, different, different cities have different ordinances. Some are based on property size. But if you're limited on your number of hives, you can get somebody in your area to kind of form a mini cooperative yourself so that if something happens like one of your hives goes queenless, the, the best solution for a queenless hive is to take one frame of open brood and add it to that hive once a week until the problem fixes itself. If you don't have another hive, you can't do that. And you are dependent on a, a commercial beekeeper somewhere to send you a queen and you know maybe the queen shows up dead or something happens or the queen isn't that good and you're just you're you're at the mercy of someone else which is not very helpful yeah not to cause you to go backwards but you said with the, the queens to requeen caught swarms mm -hmm. you do or don't do that i don't requeen caught swarms uh, unless they're really mean i like to to see what they can do in fact i have one yard where i put all my swarms for the first year so that I see how they do and they don't affect too much with my other yards. Um, I, yeah, I don't recommend people do that because you never know what you might have. Unless you know, if you've given that swarm a year or two and you figured out, I don't like this swarm, they're sickly, they're mean, whatever, then you should go ahead and requeen them. But until you know what you have, don't, don't do things arbitrarily. Know what you're doing. And last on this list is don't worry because the reason we're all doing this, we're not commercial beekeepers, we're not doing this for money, we're doing this for the enjoyment of beekeeping. You know, I've, there's been years that I make money and that's great. There's been plenty of years where I didn't make money and that's fine also because that wasn't my goal. My goal is to be a beekeeper, learn new things, enjoy what I'm doing, have fun keeping bees because if you're not having fun, maybe you shouldn't do it. That's my catchphrase, yeah. You skipped down split Oh, did I miss that? I can't go back. <coughs> yes. Uh, that's it. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. How did I miss that? Don't, if things that you should not do is not splitting and not, not doing increase. Um, if you know how to split your hives, again, that's free bees. And if you're getting free bees, you're not worried about treating. Uh, so one of my next talks will be talking about how to do that, some basic splitting methods, even into moving into some more advanced splitting methods. You can, you can quit at whatever point you don't want to go further, um, but I'm going to tell you how to go all the way up to making lower numbers of bulk queens if you want to. If you, if you get into making your own nukes and queens and selling to your, your friends here, because there's a need for that. There's no reason, if you, if you need to buy bees, it would be great if you could buy them from somebody you know in your area. 
Um, if you're a brand new beekeeper, you don't have bees yet, it'd be great if you can go to that beekeeper and get some experience before you start. It's really good to get your hands in a hive to decide if that's what you really want to do. A lot of beekeepers will, will buy their whole kit. I'd say beekeeper. They'll buy their whole kit, they'll put their package in, and they realize the first day, these things sting. <laughs> and a lot of people know that intellectually, <laughs> But until you actually get stung real good, you know, you might, you might be able to deal with one sting, but you've, you, there's going to be some times in your life where you're going to have to deal with a couple of dozen stings in one sitting. That's just part of it, and you need to be able to handle that. When I was down in, uh, down, I went down to uh, D. Lesby's conference, and um, I wear black socks, because they're so much easier to wash than white socks. Um, that don't require bleach. Uh, so I had black socks and I had low top shoes because if you all have seen my shoes I don't really wear shoes that much. Um, and so we had duct taped my ankles around my suit and my shoes so they wouldn't get any bees in there. And they're Africanized bees and they are full-on Africanized bees. There's no doubt about what's going on there. They are viciously mean. I was working on one hive about this far from another hive. My buddy Mark was working on that hive and there was bees, bad spot, there was bees on my veil. I could hardly see what I was doing. He's over there. We're like trying to, do you need a lid? Do you need a lid? Do you got a lid? You know, he can't hear me because the bees are buzzing so loud. They're just amazing. Oh, uh, Man Lake Vented Bee Suit, excellent piece of equipment there. Get one of those. Just uh, know how I know. Um, <laughs> but my, my duct tape came undone and revealed a patch of black sock between my shoe and my suit and instantly got stung about 35 times right there. And there's nothing I can do about it because there's loads of bees around and it's just going to get worse if I try to fix it. So I didn't even pull the stingers out. Just duct tape it up and keep going. If you can't deal with that at least once in your beekeeping career, I don't know what to tell you because it's going to happen. Yeah. One of the bells is only keep one or two hives. How many hives do you recommend maximum in a bee yard? Uh, the maximum number in a bee yard is going to be completely dependent on your area. My area where I am, I can probably deal with 20 hives in, in a bee yard in the spring during the flow. But year round, I don't like to keep more than 10 because later in the year when the, when the main flows are over, they're going to want to rob each other more. So your area here, I, I don't know, I don't have any idea what your flows are like, but if you have good flows throughout the summer, throughout the main season, and you can keep all those hives from robbing each other, then you can go more. It, it really depends on your condition. I, I say I like to have a minimum of five for each person just so that they, the chances of them losing all their hives in one year drop to pretty low. Is that five in one location? That's Don't have to be in one location. Just, just five so that you have um, the resources to be able to, to fix problems and, and make splits and things. Yeah? Back to your recycling of your frames. Mm -hmm. How long do you go until you pull one out and put a new foundation in? Uh, I don't keep track of them. I tried to write the dates on them, but then I got ones that I didn't put in, and so they had the wrong date on them, and I just gave that up. Just like go by like color, like how dirty they are? I usually go by color when I, when I hold them up to the sun and I can't see through the, the bottoms anymore. Okay. That's usually when I try to, try to move it out. But generally, I, I like to put one or two frames of foundation in each box in the brood nest every year. So that, you know, between five to ten years, they'll be completely swapped out. Right. Yeah. To expand on that, when you are swapping frames out, you're obviously pulling a frame that's not empty. Mm -hmm. You just count it as a loss, you set it off to the side, let it get cleaned up, or... or what I'll usually do is, by the time the frames have got to the outside, I'm assuming we're talking about a Langstroth box, um, as I'm adding new frames to the middle, got to move them out to the edges, move the ones out on the edges, they'll usually be, they won't have any brood in them. So just be honey. By that time, you know, the comb, they'll have like maybe some, some extra drone comb in them. A lot of times they'll be completely empty of, of pollen by that time. And so I can take that frame 
and put it up in the, the honey supers. Now that's another piece of advice I'll get to later. Keep all the same type of box, uh, preferably, just because you can move frames around wherever you want. It makes that process easier because then when they fill those frames up with honey uh, and I get them back to extract them, I can get done extracting, oh, this one's really dark or this one's really messed up. I can just set that aside. I have a, I have a thing, and you can see on my, one of my YouTube videos where I'm a big tank that I melt the wax out of. You can cut the wax out with a knife. It's just a little more time consuming. And then you can make candles or something. So you're using, you're also recommending or you use all um, wax foundation? Uh, mostly wax foundation, yeah. I do, I've played around also with plastic frames. I don't like them as much, the bees don't like them as much, but you can spin the crap out of them in an extractor and they never break. So that's convenient. <laughs> All right, couple conclusions here and then we can take a break. Uh, when you're beginning, especially when you're beginning, more knowledge is not better, not always better, it can be better. But the problem is that when you have more knowledge than you know what to do with, especially as a beginner, um, you can make the wrong conclusions about things. It happens all the time. Um, and you might think that you know more than you do. Really, your knowledge should come from experience. It's good to have, it's good to come to things like this and learn new things to do, but until you've done them yourself, you don't really know. You mean, don't take my word for it. Beekeeping is, all beekeeping is local. Some of the stuff I'm saying up here, undoubtedly, will not be true in your situation. You need to have that humility. I need to have that humility from the beginning. Not all the stuff I'm talking about here will work for you. Hopefully most of it will. Maybe you can take some ideas that I'm giving you here and make them fit your situation. I, I hope that's the, the case. But realize that until you actually do it and try it and know that it works for yourself, it might not work here. Just really general. Um, micromanaging in, in beekeeping, I, I believe that a certain number of new beekeepers every year inspect their hives to death. And that's one of the reasons why um, hives die so often in the first year. You don't need to inspect your hives once a week. If you do want to, it, it's good to get in there and get that experience. Feel around in a hive. You'll you'll learn things that you can't even describe. You'll eventually, hopefully, you'll be able to open a hive and, and without even looking, or you might look at the entrance and realize that the hive's queenless. You might not even know why. You just know that it is, and you get into it and you find that it's true. You can only get that experience by doing it. But if you take that one hive and inspect it every week, you're basically at the minimum you are you are completely messing up their whole program for one day every week. If you have more hives, you can do one hive a week and spread that out more. But I really don't think that people should inspect any single hive more than once every three weeks or a month or so. Let them do their thing. Care less, enjoy more. That refers to our mindset in treatment-free beekeeping because losing bees isn't like losing a pet. Um, if you buy a dog, you spend hundreds of dollars in dog food every year, the dog's going to grow old, you have the dog put down. That's sad because that's a, that's a mammal. You are, you have imprinted on that. Don't imprint on bees. They're insects. They don't care about you at all. They will not be happy when you come home. <laughs> They're not a child, also. <laughs> um, so enjoy what you're doing for what it is, and don't make it into something it isn't. A dog is your friend, mm -hmm. as as unintelligent as they may be. They will be your friend. They love you. They're happy when you come home. Bees don't give a rip. So so the beekeeping is there for you to enjoy what an insect has to provide you, which is a different look at the world. That's really great, but it's not a dog. Um, and most important thing, like I said earlier, don't buy bees. They cost money. 
you want to protect your investment that's going to going to tempt you to treat, try and protect your investment and it gets back into more micromanagement and that's not not helpful. All right, so let's take a Oh, any more questions before we go and we'll have a quick break and then we'll move on to the next one. Yes. Um, I really like that you mentioned Tom Staley. He has some very interesting research. Um, I listened to him over the summer at a conference and he is an advocate. Well, instead of the let die method, he uh, suggests uh, the reclaiming and possible, and if not, actually euthanasia, which could be a more uh, task for a more experienced beekeeper, especially in dire situations where viruses are noticeable all throughout the colony. And I was just wondering if you have an opinion on that. Yeah, that's. I don't have any um, any objection to that. Uh, my typical method of euthanasia is through, um, well, let me explain that real quick. Um, when I make my nukes, a lot of times I will take most of the brood out of a hive. And if that hive doesn't rebuild by the next year, if I come back to get brood again and there's only like two or three frames, I'll probably just pinch that queen and take that brood and make a new hive and put a queen, new queen with it. It's essentially requeening the hive. But I'm, you know, instead of a hive this big, I now have a little nuke. And then that will maybe build up into a big hive again. Uh, late in the fall, if I'm, if I'm at, my, at my preferred population and I don't need, I, I can afford to lose some, I will take hives that have no stores to, to, to avoid feeding them over winter. Take those hives, take the brood, put them in another hive, squish the queen. Um, there's usually no reason to kill the whole hive. You can, you can do something else with it. If it's severely messed up with, um, well, like foul brood would be a good example. I would, unless you're an expert beekeeper who, who's pretty confident that they have hygienic bees, just euthanize that. Um, the typical solution is burning. Um, you don't necessarily have to do that. You can, if you have access to uh, irradiation. Some people have access to beehive irradiation. You can deal with it that way. Um, if it's a very minor infection, you can just burn the frames, keep the boxes, um, scorch them out, they usually say, with a torch. Another thing you can do is wax dip them. You, you're basically uh, deep frying the, the box in wax. And while that doesn't necessarily kill every um, spore that might be in that box, you're encasing it in wax so it can never do anything ever again. Um, if you really need to euthanize a hive, I would recommend don't do the gasoline because that goes into your wax and, and sort of poisons it. Um, you can take a heavy duty trash bag, wrap the hive up, tape it up. It will suffocate pretty quickly. You can reuse the equipment probably the next day. Or soapy water over the colony. Soapy water you can spray, or, or you can spray the bees with soapy water. And I think that you only suggest doing that in extreme circumstances for what you mentioned earlier, not creating a mite bomb, especially if you have a large yard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, the typical way to euthanize whole hives in the past has been to uh, take a kiddie pool fill it with soapy water and just shake the bees into it and they will suffocate pretty quickly. So that's kind of a morbid topic, but um, again, that's like American foul brood. It, it's, a, it's a treatment free way to get rid of that problem without letting, letting your bees infect other bees. Any other questions? Yeah. I just think that point out that the Montgomery County chapter does have a irradiation program that you do every March. Um, okay. They take it to New Jersey. In case anybody's familiar with that, they always recommend for getting used equipment, used comb, do, the, do that and, and look into that program if you want to participate. It's not too expensive. And mentioning Tom Seeley, he'll be in Philly at a conference coming up. If you're interested also as well, there's some postcards over here. Yes, there's some postcards over here that have that information. And yeah, they do wax dipping. 
Montgomery does wax dipping. Yep, yep, so does Chester County. Wax dipping also. I want to do wax dipping, but I just haven't gotten around to it. Maybe I'll do that this year. Any still, other questions? It's still usually a paraffin dip, so it is an oil-based dip. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've heard of people doing that with beeswax, but beeswax cannot handle higher temperatures like paraffin can. Um, beeswax will start to start to turn brown at about 180 degrees and will catch on fire not too long after that. Whereas paraffin, some of the heavier paraffin can handle 300 degrees or more. So you can get a better better fry on it. The one I participated, I went to to check yeah. out, um, they used some resins, they used yeah. paraffin, they used some microcrystalline. Microcrystalline um, wax, yeah. It was a concoction and it seemed to be... Good yeah, very if you want to do that, go online, find some, some recipes, figure out how to do that. It's, it's interesting. And it, you, you don't have to paint your hive necessarily. You can. You can, you know, keep white hives or whatever color you want. Oh, but you don't have to, and so you can have more wood, you know, weathered wood-looking hives, which can be attractive in your, depending on the way you like to do it. All right, let's take a quick 10-minute break, and then we will start on the next one. Yeah.